Welcome back to the 131st episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including a Georgia teacher fired for just reading a book, how the social fabric is falling apart, and maybe it has something to do with early development of children here in America, and an interesting article talking about how Texas is more reliant on green energy than they would like you to think. And of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling from me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So I'm going to get really personal here for a second. If you were to have kids, not saying you want them, not saying that you have them, but if you wanted a kid, at what age would you talk to them about the birds and the bees, what age would you have that talk with them? It feels as though that age is getting lower or younger and younger every few years. And I'm really curious where a lot of people stand on this issue because, you know, they have the internet now. They could find all of it on their own. So does that mean that you have to come in as the moral authority a little bit earlier? Does that provoke that feeling in you? Or you're like, nah, you know, kids are going to be kids. They're going to find out when they find out. Let me know what you think. Throw it down in the comment section. I'd love to hear what everybody has to say. Let's jump into our first article that comes from Daily Koss. Unbelievable. Georgia teacher teacher fired for reading children's book. So, obviously, we have seen over the course of the last year, all throughout the nation, there have been lots of bills being passed about what teachers can do in their classrooms and how much oversight parents can have within the classroom. And this headline, it's not wrong. It's just really oversimplifying the matter. Obviously, yes, it was just for reading a book, but was it a book that was not on the approved list of books? And, you know, people will go back and forth arguing whether there should be an approved group of books that are allowed. And even then, some people will say, well, why is this particular book on that list? There will be lots of discussions about this here, but let's at least get the facts straight, and then we can have a conversation about that. Quote, Georgia's new school censorship law have claimed their first own victim. Cobb County Elementary School teacher Katie Ritherly was fired for reading her class a book she bought at a school book fair because the book's message of accepting and embracing differences often offended some parents. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, Rinderly had offered her fifth-grade gifted program students a choice of books to read and discuss, and they chose Scott Stewart's My Shadow is Purple, which you can check out here. The book centers on the child who looks at their mom's pink shadow and then looks at their father's blue shadow and doesn't identify fully with either. Their shadow is purple, and they have traits in common with each of their parents. At a school dance, a child is pressured to choose pink or blue, but ultimately other kids speak out and say that actually their shadows aren't pink or blue either. They're yellow, brown, green, red, end quote. So, honestly, this book seems pretty pretty simple and pretty straightforward on its face. And I would say this is not bad. And you can interpret it however you want. If I wanted to say that my friend Bobby's shadow is blue, but I wanted to say that my shadow is not blue, it's actually magenta or some other color, then you're just trying to identify that, hey, we are all individuals. We all have differences. And it doesn't necessarily matter what somebody else's shadow is. You don't have to fit in with that group. You don't have to force yourself to do so. I feel like that is a message that is innocent enough. But if it's speaking about gender identity, if it's saying that, well, blue is a stereotypically male color, Pig is a stereotypically girl color, and this person doesn't feel like they belong to either group, then I think that that is not a discussion that should be had in school. I know, I know, I'm going through all the talking points. I think that if there are teachers who are teaching this material, they need to be extremely cautious and make sure that they're not 
pushing the envelope here and raising more questions about the gender identity aspect of this. They need to be saying, hey, this is a conversation that you need to have with your parents. Because I really do believe each individual is different. I think that is not that hard to believe. But I also believe that every individual is socialized into a system that allows us to cooperate, to work together, to hold standards and norms, and also to develop values that allow society to thrive. So what are the institutions that hem that in, that make sure that everybody's socialized properly? Well, obviously, school is one of them, but the primary one should be the parents. So you go back to the parents and you say, hey, your child was asking these particular questions in school. You can talk to them about it however you want to do so. Let me just hand it off to you. This is not my territory. Because even though, like I just admitted, school is a place to become socialized, to be interacting with a whole bunch of different people from these different substratas of the population and to allow you to become more familiar with how our society works, the main socialization should be happening within the household because the parents have the ultimate dominion over the child. And obviously there are cases where the parents are really, really bad at doing their job. They're really bad at socializing their child. They're being abusive to the child. And then we have to, as a society, have to say, okay, there is a limit here. We have to step in and we have to make sure that we help this child. But the parents should have ultimate dominion until proven otherwise that they are abusing a child. And I think that in these conversations about gender identity, in these conversations about affirming a belief that the child has and the parents are getting their custody taken away because they won't go forward and actually uh, reaffirm what a four-year-old or a five-year-old or even a ten-year-old is saying, that that is a really slippery, tricky slope. Why would you let someone that young who doesn't have a full understanding of the world, let alone themselves, or sorry, you could inverse that, doesn't have a full understanding of themselves, let alone the world, why would you let them make a decision like that? Why would you endorse that way of thinking? Because while you do want them to be an individual and they are different, like I said, there are certain mechanisms to hem in certain ways of thinking, certain ideas that are come up in the child's mind in order to make sure that they're more socially acceptable and they'll be able to thrive in society. Think of it this way. Some kids want to just eat candy all day and they they believe that they have the right to eat candy, that they should be able to eat this candy. It's part of their individual thought process. I love candy. I want more of it all the time. But parents have to say, no, 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 no. You can't just eat candy all day. You're going to get fat. You're not going to be able to run. You're not going to be able to participate in sports. You're not going to be able to participate in the normal social structure, and it may hurt you down the line. And you need to learn to be healthy when you're on your own because we want you to outlive us. We want our child to outlive us as parents, and we don't want to see you die of obesity or a heart attack. So that is the individual want, need, or thought process of a child being hemmed in properly by a social structure. So why wouldn't that apply here when talking about these more sensitive topics, at least nowadays in the culture war? I think that this is a framing metric that has been taken out of context a lot. And I also think that this story that the author read, if it is not put in the frames of gender identity, I think it is completely innocent. I think that it can very well highlight to kids yeah, there are different ways of thinking. It doesn't mean that you absolutely have to fall into one category or another. It also doesn't mean that you have to rebel to rebel for rebellion's sake. If you feel that your shadow is purple, but your mom's is red and your dad's is blue, that doesn't mean that you're not going to shift a little bit to blue as you gain a little bit of experience in the world. It doesn't mean that you're not going to shift to red. It doesn't even mean that you have to fall into blue or red, because you are your own individual. You can have your own color. But when put in terms of gender identity, which is what it's obviously alluding to, then that's when I think it becomes a problem. 
And if you're a parent and you want this for your child and you are going to affirm what they believe that they are non-binary or whatever, that is your prerogative as a parent. I'm not going to step in. I, you know, for a while there, I had thought a little bit differently about this, which is, no, 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 we, you know, as a society, we can't be having this, blah, blah, blah. And then the question kept getting posed to me, does the, do the parents have the ultimate say? If the parents have the ultimate say, then they should be able to choose whether or not to go forward with some of these social transitions, these other sort of issues. And I do believe that is the case. I do believe that the parents, it is their child. doesn't mean I agree with what they're doing. It doesn't mean that I'm going to fully endorse what they're doing with their child, but I will die for their right to do it because it is their child. Now, there are other people that are a little bit more out there on this issue. They're, they're saying, no, no, we have to outright ban these practices altogether. And I do think that the government shouldn't be endorsing certain policies. But that doesn't mean that the free market can't exist where parents can still have a choice how they handle the health care or the addressing of issues with their child. And any other perspective is hypocritical from either side, in my opinion. You let other parents do what they, as they wish with their child. You don't get involved because think about it this way. You probably have that one mother who always gives their kids sweets. And you have another mother who always tells their kids, no, they can't have sweets. What, do you step in every single time if you adamantly believe that kids should be able to have sweets and tell them that they're a terrible parent, that they're gonna, you're going to take their kid away because they have a different dietary preference for their child? No, that's insane. So we need to come back to a place of common sense, in my opinion. And the other interesting part about this article, and why I think it's a little, a little sad that the teacher is being fired over this, is because... Just because the parents are offended by it, they didn't actually, it doesn't appear that they gave her a full remedy, which wasn't, oh, no, 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 just don't do this anymore. Don't don't teach this certain thing anymore, and we'll move forward from there. It was basically, oh, you read something that they didn't like. It offended the parents, and this is a hot-button issue. We don't want to deal with it. Quote, following complaints from a small number of parents, and despite other parents vocally supporting her, Renderly was investigated, told to resign or fire, be fired, and fired, two days after she read My Shadow is Purple to her class. Rendingler Lee was summoned to the principal's office twice for meetings. Quote, when I asked why this book was available in our school's recent scholastic book fair, especially if it's not deemed appropriate, there was no clear answer that could be given, end quote. Yeah, I think that's one. This was a really speedy, hey, get the heck out. They just didn't want to deal with the political backlash, so they said, get out, which isn't fair. They never gave her a chance to come and say, okay, hey, I did something wrong, or at least I did something that I didn't know was wrong, because that's how she's framing it here, because she bought it from the book fair, and give me a chance to come back and teach something else. No, they were just like, we're not dealing with the political fallout, you're out, which I think is an overreaction to this sort of problem that's been addressed and really been hyped up in the media. And also, I agree with her point. Though I don't think that she should teach that book in a framing of gender ideology or anything like that, I 100% agree with her point. Why is it at the book fair if it's not allowed? Why is the school allowing the book fair to sell that book in a school where that book is banned? Because that speaks, that what that says to me is that the school is not check, actually checking what is being sold in the Scholastic Book Fair, if that's the case. If they were to say, oh, well, we didn't know that they were selling that book, I feel like that's the only valid argument. Otherwise, they're allowing a book to be sold that is banned, which seems reckless. So the only solution is they just didn't know that it was being sold in the book fair, which also shows negligence on the point of the school, not actually verifying what b books are being brought into the Scholastic Book Fair because their policy is that they shouldn't be teaching this material, but the material could still be sold to kids if they so chose. I, I feel like that's a little bit of a contrast, and I feel like the school wasn't being as diligent as it should have been when checking the books that were being sold at this book fair, because they did just put their professor, their teacher, in an awkward position, because normally these, at least the one that I always had at my school, the book fair was always school-sanctioned, 
And our librarian, I don't know if she went through every single book, but I'll tell you now, there were books that she definitely preferred that she put forward towards the front because I knew, or at least we all knew, what her ideas about life were. We knew what her ideology, her point of view was for the most part. And you could see it come out in some of the books that she would put towards the front rather than some of the other ones that she would put towards the back. So I think that the school really messed this teacher's schedule up. They really put her in a very tough position. And also they were too hasty to implement changes rather than give her a chance to you know, either refute the case or change her habits so that she could keep her job. And lots of other kids who really did like her. And I think that it speaks to the fact that she wasn't a bad teacher trying to push a certain ideology just outright. She was a teacher who was trying to help these kids. And she affected a few good lives. And just because she made one mistake, and we don't, it's not clarified whether it's intentional or not, but even if she made one mistake and wasn't given a chance to reform, I don't think that that is, I don't think that's okay. I think it was overly harsh. But I also don't think that she should be teaching a book like that in terms of ideology. It needs to be something that is talked about with the parents. The parents, it's their kid. They have the ultimate say. Unless they're being overly abusive, you know, add all the caveats of terrible parental behavior. But even that, I don't like adding that caveat because then you have to get into the conversation about what is uh, abusive and things like that. And that's a very contentious one because some people would say that certain practices that are completely normal in some people's lives are abusive and vice versa. So it's a tricky landscape out there. And this teacher got fired for reading a book that was endorsed or at least at least allowed to be sold at a book fair at the school. All right, let's jump to our second article, which comes from the Washington Examiner. Rebuilding America's social capital starts with er- the early years, addressing the youth mental health crisis. So this is a topic that I've always been semi-passionate about and had longer discussions about here on the podcast, which is youth mental health. Why is it going downhill? Why are we seeing larger amounts of depression, anxiety? We're also starting to see other social phenomenon, which are putting a lot of pressure on kids. You're seeing don't work movements from some of the younger guys, the kids who go on TikTok. And let's be clear, you know, It goes on TikTok. It doesn't mean that a large majority of the population doesn't want to do something, but there are those trends of, hey, no, we uh, we don't want to work. You know, we want to stay home. We want to do passive investing. I mean, that's why passive investing has gained a lot of traction in our generation because they don't necessarily want to work as much. They want to stay home. They don't want to go into new environments that are anxious. And this is me extrapolating why. There are obviously other factors. But if I had to look at it, it's because the outside of their house or different areas provide anxiety and their house is comfortable and they can earn passive income without having to do too much because it could be too overwhelming. The expectations at work could be very hard. They don't necessarily want to thrive, strive, and push the envelope. And of course, there are counterexamples. There are lots of people who do want to do that. But you, you've seen a lot of these trends take off and it does speak to the fact that maybe there's something there. Well, the Washington Examiner has a very interesting perspective, or at least a very interesting idea as to why this is happening. And the first quote is a a little bit of a long one, so we'll break it up about halfway, but I do at least want to get this one out of the way. Quote, social capital, the rich network of relationships that builds trust and predicts beneficial life outcomes is long on the wane in the United States an often overlooked area of relational development that could help to reserve this de- reverse this decline is the early years, those first years of life where patterns of all future relationships are established. The human brain is too large to develop in euro, growing only 25% of its adult size at birth to 80% at three, age 3. Often taken for granted, this brain development with synaptic connections made at a rate of 1 million per second in the first three years of life takes place in the context of a relationship, in particular, a connection with the mother, her voice, eye-to-eye contact, and touch invested in predictable, abundant, and atoned care. Fathers play a significant role, but secondary role in this process. Yet much of the science is casually ignored at the economy that pushes both parents to work. 
one in four mothers often of necessity return to work two weeks after giving birth. A report out this week, the Social Capital Campaign published research that explores the positive effects of secure attachment on zero to threes on overall mental health, self-regulation, empathy, performance at school, and quality of relationships in adult life, end quote. I know I was going to break it up, but there wasn't a good place to do it. And also, I feel like we really need to take that information in. Okay, so let's go back and analyze the really important things. About 25% of the brain is fully formed when you're born. By the time you're three, it's getting close to 80%. That is, and listen here, one million neurons, synaptic connections being created per second within the first three years of any human's life. And there's been a study that comes out that one in four moms, 25% of mothers in the United States, go back to work within two weeks. That child only gets two weeks of full attention, connection, love, eye-to-eye contact, recognition, relationship development with that mother. Of course, of course, when you come home from work, when you're up late at night, baby doing everything in order to make sure that the baby is healthy, then you're still making that connection. But two weeks of full engagement from the mother, being there constantly, always being the one to nurture those relationships, and the one who actually has a biological connection. I wonder here if there's actually pheromones involved too. This is a question. I mean, I know pheromones have a tricky connotation because they're related to attraction between two people who are in a couple normally. But there's probably pheromones that the mother and baby both release during this time, which allows the baby, if they can't actually see, or if they're not able to distinctly say, oh, yes, this is my mother, because their brain's not fully developed on a simple biological level, through the exchange of pheromones, they're able to say, oh, yes, this is my mother. Maybe that also plays into it, but that's speculation. But the point here is that these connections that at the very beginning of our lives can really affect how you interact with the rest of the world throughout the rest of your life, if they're not maintained in a healthy way, if the mother is not there in order to provide for their child and to have healthy, long-term, sustained relationships with these childs in these first three very formative years, it can greatly affect how the outcome of that child or what the outcome of that child's life will be. Will they have social anxiety? Will they have a hard time trusting people because they feel like they didn't get all the attention on a biological, a simple level that they needed as a child? And the other thing here is the reason this is also outrageous is because you could argue, oh, well, it's a developed country thing. In, In developed countries... Moms just have to go back to work and, you know, we're not necessarily seeing all of these same, we're seeing some of these same trends uh, across other countries, maybe not necessarily as bad, but we're still seeing some overall anxiety and depression, so it may be other factors. But listen here to the United States compared to other developed countries. Quote, other developed countries accommodate the reality that women give birth and provide paid support to allow mothers to bond with their children. The average total paid leave available to mothers in the European Union is 64.6 weeks. The E, the OECD, 50.8 weeks, and up to 17 weeks from the 1970s. The United States offers 12 weeks of unpaid leave nationally for those working 50 plus within 50 plus employees. So think about that. Think about that. weeks for European Union mothers versus 12 weeks for the United States. 12 weeks, so you get three months. Three months, you know, that's that's nice, right? You get three months with your kid. Make sure you can get everything coordinated. Well, let's do the very quick math on the 64. So I just threw it into the calculator. 64 weeks divided by 4 is 16. 16 months that these mothers get in these other countries. That is practically a year and a quarter, a year and a third, actually. So these parents get a year and a third with their kid before they have to consider going back to work, or at least they're going to go back to work and be paid. They could still keep going on leave, possibly, if their company is very gracious 
But think about that. Think about that. That is an extra year at the most, maybe nine to ten months at the least, that these parents get to form connections with their children and provide a brief and simple understanding of how human interaction, how humans build relationships, how that this child can actually trust people. This child doesn't have to worry, be anxious because they don't have their mother around, that they don't have to be anxious because they're constantly switching between caregivers. No, they can have stability. They can have their mother or you know their father, but preferably, as the article goes on to say, fathers can do it, but preferably their mother who birthed them. <laughs> Remember that here. That's the ultimate sacred connection. That child was gestated within the mother for nine months and was birthed from her. She went through all that pain in order to have that child. And let's be clear, the child doesn't know that on a deep psychological level, but there is a connection there that is being devalued when we say, oh, no, 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 you only get three months with your kid that you just held for nine months and you had to constantly feed and you had to go through the pain of labor and you had to go through all these hormonal and dietary changes in order to make sure that that child was successfully born. You only get three months with them once they're out of your womb, and then you can hand them off to daycare or somebody else to deal with them. That is, I feel like that's, I don't want to say dehumanizing, I just, I feel like that's misunderstanding the the sacredness of the bond between a mother and child. And as the article says, it's not just this factor that's leading to higher anxiety. We have social media, we have overexposure, to just phones in general. You have a wider social network now. Anything you do in class could be broadcast to the entire school rather than a friend group or just your class within minutes if something goes wrong on Snapchat or so on. So there are other factors, of course, and then some people would argue that the environmental crisis is adding to teens' depression. There are lots of different factors, but this could be a very important one And I feel like it's one that we could more easily address than some of the other ones that are more societal overall or cultural changes that would have to be made to de-incentivize social media. This one is, hey, let's put some more child care or motherly leave time, uh, larger leave times for mothers on the books in different legislations or different jurisdictions through legislators. And, you know, maybe the businesses wouldn't like that. They're losing a little bit of their profits that are they're gaining from these mothers who are coming back to work early. And some mothers, they need that work. Some mothers love their kids, but they also need that work to feel stimulated and motivated. And obviously, it's a ba- case-by-case basis, but we should open it up so that mothers that do want to stay out of the workforce a little bit longer and really nurture their child at the beginning have the option to do so. I feel like that is not an insane proposition. I also feel like maybe we should have an economy that allows mothers to stay home overall. But that is a lot trickier of a idea and the implementing of different changes in the society, which because I would want it to be a social change rather than a government-mandated economic change, that's a larger conversation. We'll get into that some other day. All right, so we're going to do a really, really quick article from Common Dreams. Analyst says solar is saving Texas from widespread power outages amid extreme heat. So let's I'll pull out the two quotes, and I'll get through them very quickly, and then I'll make a comment or two, and then we'll move on to our daily delight. Quote, a sweltering heat wave has gripped Texas over the last two weeks, pushing temperatures to 115 degrees Fahrenheit in parts of the state. But its status as a new leader in the development of solar power has reportedly protected many in the state from a catastrophic loss of power. An intense heat dome in which the area of high pressure traps heat underneath it has settled over northern Mexico and is expected to persist next week and potentially beyond, likely causing heat, the heat index to reach into the hundreds across Texas and top out at 120 degrees. Quote, while Texas has built its reputation in recent decades as a center of oil and gas production in the United States, quote, solar is producing 15% of the total energy right now, University of Texas researcher scientist Joshua Rhodes told the Times. The state now leads the nation in renewable energy with 17 gigawatts of solar power operational this year, end quote. 
So this is this is a lot. This is what 15% of their total energy outcome. They're producing a lot of green energy. And of course, the talking point has been, oh, it's Texas, it's oil, it's natural gas. And that doesn't seem to be the it doesn't seem to be slowing down. They're just having alternatives. Now, this is where I think the framing of this article is wrong. They're saying, oh, well, Texas is a little bit hypocritical. Oh, look, this solar energy is actually protecting the people because it's not putting too much strain on other sources of electricity. And they're calling out Texas saying, hey, you know that this solar is working really well. It's actually helping you in this situation. Maybe you should push even more for it. But then the caveat is while also dropping fossil fuel. My thing is push for all of them. Push for more natural gas, natural gas, push for more oil, push for more solar, for more wind turbines, for more geothermal, even though I'm pretty sure Texas is not a geothermal hotspot, more nuclear. We need to have an extremely robust system because of situations exactly like this. They're right. Solar may be helping relieve some of the pressure on other energy sources. So the more energy sources you have, the less dependent on one singular one you are. What happens if there's a chip shortage and they're not able to get replacement parts for the solar panel or new solar panels? Well then, hey, we have still have wind turbines, we still have nuclear, we still have natural gas, and we still have oil. Meaning you have three other industries, three other, other energy producing industries, not let alone even hydro. If they have access to the Rio Grande, maybe they could do hydro. You have five other things that need to fail fully or at least partially before you're in a deep crisis. We need to fully address the infrastructure crisis and build out the infrastructure to get electricity across the United States. But we also need to be addressing all of these industries and saying, hey, we know that you're vital when we're talking about the old school, the natural gas and the oil but also speaking to the new innovators who are in these green energies and say, we need you too. We need all of you in order to move forward. If you really want a green economy, you can't just put up the green economy and then say goodbye fossil fuels. You have to say, okay, we're going to make a long-term transition. So people that are environmentally savvy should still want this to be the case because in order for them to fully replace the fossil fuels, you have to have the infrastructure large enough to do so. So you can't just argue it is solar power, green energy, or fossil fuels because these economies, they're not ready to transition away from fossil fuels. So if you're giving them an either or, they're going to stick with what they know. You have to build out the infrastructure in every single direction. And then over time, maybe as it becomes harder and more expensive to do natural gas and oil because we're running out, then the solar gets even more investment because you already have some infrastructure there and you've already built out the network for it, and now it's a cheaper option. But we should have to, as a United States, we have to expand it in every direction, not just focus on one or the other. And I do think it's great that Texas is the largest solar producer. They're using it effectively, and it's saving lives, or at least it's having some effect on protecting people from this extreme heat wave. I love to hear it, and this is why it is so important to have a diverse set of energy that we can take from. And some of it's green, some of it's not necessarily green. But this is a story that was framed in a way that is kind of pissing off environmentalists. No, no, this should make you happy. Because the largest fossil fuel producing state in the United States also has the largest green energy, speaking to its effectiveness and how it's saving lives. This story should delight you. It should delight everybody. All right, that's enough on that one. Let's jump to our daily delight. This one comes from The Laughing Squid. An adorable compilation of wolf pup trying to howl. So when you're young, you you know, you look up to your parents, you look up to your friends or maybe some celebrities, and you try to emulate them. And it's nice to see that this is common across the entire animal kingdom, not just in our little human sector of the world. Quote, the determined folks at Voyeurs of Wolf Project compiled adorable footage of a tiny wolf pup trying to howl with all their respective might. End quote. And trust me, this little guy, he is very, very determined. And the compilation is honestly kind of cute. Quote, the video is the best of the wolf pup howls should start everyone's day off with a high note. End quote. And if you want to see this video, this compilation, or any of the cute photos, or read any of today's articles, there'll be a link in the description below that like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Podvine, as well as the Twitter handle at Your Daily Flip. 
I'm putting out Twitter tirades. They are exclusive Twitter content. You can go over there 10 minutes really quick. Basically the same thing. It's a, a video. I take that back. It's an audio reproduction with the video embedded on Twitter. So you can go watch that there. With all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.